been good to be here today, hasn't it, already? Well, an essential part of uh, Christmas decorating is the creche, is it not? And uh, there's a lot of different figurines that are a part of the uh, manger display. And so I thought today that it might be good for us to take a, a brief tour of various ways that people have personalized the Christmas creche. Are you ready? So we're going to be on the screen. First of all, we have the traditional creche. You see it a little bit bigger than uh, it was on the table. And so that's the traditional tr Christmas creche. Well, uh, let's go ahead and let's travel to Mongolia. And so this is what the Mongolians have done with the creche. And notice they've replaced the uh, wooden structure with a gear, which is basically a, a very sophisticated tent, and it is used out in the, the outlying parts of Mongolia. So we'll go from Mongolia, and let's go to China. And so we've got a very simple creche there, and you see that Joseph and Mary look very Asian, don't they? Yes, they do. Well, we come, from, uh, we come from China, and we come to Brazil. And Brazil is a favorite of mine. I've been there six times on mission trips. And so you just notice that it's, it's kind of got a, a jungle, uh, you know, Amazon, tropical feel to it, doesn't it? Much, uh, uh, that, that's a crash from Brazil. All right, now we move from countries to some special interest people. So here we have the baker's version of uh, the Christmas crash. And, of course, for those of you who have Christmas birthdays, this might be a way for you to consider how you're going to go ahead and decorate your uh, birthday cake. And then we move to a crash that is what I call, it's filled with sausage and bacon and sauerkraut. I call it the meat lover's crash. And, of course, uh, my son says, you know, that's the one that will also give you salmonella if you keep it out for too long. Okay, so we come now to the next one, which is the uh, crash as put forth by the local electric utility company. And next after that, of course, we have to have a Christmas crash for the geeky Star Wars people, don't we? Absolutely. And then from there, we, what would Christmas be without a Charlie Brown contribution? So very, very significant. And then finally, we have this one that goes back to country. And this is a Filipino crash. And you'll notice that the, the Magi is coming with a very nice dinner jacket. And, of course, it's got a barbecue spit, which I like especially. But notice the animal that's being barbecued. This is not a kosher crash. <laughs> Definitely not kosher. And so uh, you, uh, those are just kind of a little bit of tour of what people have done with the crash. Now, it's obvious that people have taken great poetic license with the Christmas crash. Now, in one sense, this is really good, really good, because Jesus is for the entire world, is he not? So what I want to do today is I want to focus upon the different figures in the Christmas crash. And as we look at these, I want you to understand, as I see, that there is a significance to each of these figures that goes beyond their single life. And so we're going to begin today with the stars. And we've got two stars in the crash. And, of course, in Matthew chapter 2, in verse 1, we're told that it was the star that led the Magi to Jerusalem. Now, some astronomers have said that there was a conjunction uh, of the planets Jupiter and Saturn within the constellation of Pisces. It occurred in 7 BC, and it was that brilliant star that led the Magi to Jerusalem. That conjunction occurs every 20 years. However, it's only every 800 years that the planets are that close, producing the brilliance of that star, and visible at night. And tomorrow night is going to be the closest it's been in about 800 years. So, Al, good for you for mentioning that uh, to our families. Now, others have said that this was a supernatural star that God sent for this very specific purpose. Ultimately, we don't know which it is, nor does it impact the story. 
However, I do believe that the star represents all heaven and all nature worshiping at the crash. Did you know that the heavens are great worshipers? Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And of course, they would rejoice. Now, the heavens and the earth felt the curse of the fall. In Romans 8, we are told that the whole world groans. It groans under the curse of sin. And so, when Jesus, as the newborn king, is born, and some of the curse of the fall is going to begin to be reversed. Of course, the heavens and all nature would sing. Isaac Watts said it so well in his carol, Joy to the World. Remember that refrain? Let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. It was rejoicing because the liberator from the curse of of, the, of sin upon the heavens and nature was beginning to be reversed. And so we have the star. Next we have the angel. And of course we know this, that, that angels were all over the Christmas story. As Justin said so very, very well, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah in the temple. Later he appeared to Mary in Nazareth. We are told that an unnamed angel appeared to Joseph and assured him that Mary was telling the truth. We have the, the, the angelic host that, that sang to the shepherds uh, on the hills outside of Bethlehem. And you can just know for certain that all those sheep were scattered when that angelic host began to sing. And then, of course, later on, after Jesus was born, and another angel appeared to Joseph and said, Joseph, take, take the child and Mary and go to Egypt and stay there because there is great danger for the child. And so how appropriate it is that angels were there at the creche to worship Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we, we talked a little bit about good angels and fallen angels. And we know that there was one-third of the angelic host that rebelled against the supremacy of God, and they became uh, evil spirits, and they have as their mission to destroy, to disrupt the plan of God for the redemption of the world. How else can we understand the slaughter of the innocents by King Herod? That was demonic-inspired activity by King Herod. So we know this, that bad angels were not at the creche that evening, but the good angels, those, those messengers of God, those who, who communicate not only the truth of God, but also to, to uh, execute His will, they were there. And they were rejoicing because they saw that the curse and, and the, the, the work of Satan was now beginning to be reversed because of the birth of this newborn king. And so they were there. And when that angelic choir began to sing to the shepherds over uh, Bethlehem that night, I want you to know that there was a deep shudder in the underworld. The underworld took note of what the angels were proclaiming. And so how appropriate it is for the angels to be at the crash that evening. Well, we've got some animals also in the crash, do we not? And so the question is, were animals present? Well, actually, the Bible doesn't ever say that Bibles were present, but we can assume that they were. And so I want to show on the screen a, a picture of a home in first century Bethlehem or perhaps Nazareth. It's a reconstruction of what a typical home was like to, in a poor family, which Joseph was, was, a, uh, was a poor um, carpenter. And so this is a reconstruction of what uh, a home would be like in the first century in that community. It's not very large, 
but it did have three levels to it. And so the next picture is a reconstruction of the interior of a first century house. So first of all, you'll notice that on the first floor, there is the courtyard. And next to the courtyard, there would be the kitchen where they would do the cooking. There would be a place, a stable for the animals. And there was some uh, area to visit there. There was a mikvah, which was used for uh, ceremonial cleaning. And so all of that was on the first floor uh, of their home. And then when you go to the second floor uh, or the second level, this would be what is called the upper room. And so this was where most of the living occurred. This is where the sleeping occurred. It was a small space in a a poor house. It was probably small, and it was rather dark. And then there's the third level, which would have been the roof. And there was oftentimes a, a shaded portion of that so that in the summer on a hot day, they could go up there and they could sit in the shade and they would feel the breeze that would be coming. And of course, on a warm evening, they would also want to sleep on the roof to feel the cool breeze, uh, to cooling muscle so that they would be able to sleep. Now, what happens is that, as we understand the story in Luke chapter 2, is that the spare room where the guests would stay was occupied so that Joseph and Mary were forced to sleep on the first floor where the animals were kept. And so into this setting, then, is born this newborn king. Max Lucado writes this. The stable stinks like all stables do. The stench of urine, dung, and sheep rises pungently in the air. The ground is hard, the hay scarce, cobwebs cling to the ceiling, and a mouse scurries about the dirt floor. Kind of gives us a picture of what that must have been like. I think it is incredibly significant, however, that that animals are included in the crash. Because animals, too, felt the curse of sin. Today, there's an expression when we study science that we learn. It's called the survival of the fittest, which means that animals prey upon one another. That was not God's original plan. The survival of the fittest is a reminder to us of the curse of sin. Today... uh, Archaeologists are discovering fossils of of creatures that we have never seen. And they put together caricatures of what they think that animal was. Why did the dinosaurs die? Why don't we have any of those T-Rexes and those majestic creatures today? The curse of sin. Thousands of animals today are on the uh, endangered species list. Why? Because of the curse of sin. So the animal kingdom felt very keenly the fall and its curse upon the world. And when this one who was born king of the Jews, the liberators come, how appropriate it was for animals to be there. Because they would experience also the blessing of having the re- curse reversed. So we have the animals. Well, how about these guys? We have the shepherds. Now we know this, that the shepherds were watching over their flocks and they were keeping uh, watch over the flocks that would be used for the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. Now the number of sheep that were slaughtered on a weekly basis in Jerusalem in the temple there was just astounding. And so that evening, the shepherds come and they worship the Christ. Now, shepherding was a vocation that went back 2,000 years to Abraham. He was a semi-nomad. He had vast herds of sheep and cattle, donkeys, as well as camels. And when the patriarchs, they were also shepherds, and when they came into the promised land, they added to their shepherding uh, that of becoming farmers. 
they never gave up their, their desire to uh, be a herder and to be a shepherd. And then, of course, with the introduction of the sacrificial system and the law and the significance of sheep and, uh, and rams were very, very significant in, in uh, the sacrificial system. And so the fact that shepherds were at the, the creche is symbolic. It's symbolic, first of all, to me, uh, of tradespeople. Uh, men who work with their hands. Uh, men who, these shepherds had the night shift. Not all of them had night shift, but some of them did. But shepherds were men who, who had calloused hands. They, they worked with their hands. And when they went to bed at night, they were tired. Their bones were, were tired and weary. And they enjoyed uh, their rest because they worked hard day in and day out. And so... They represent people, in my estimation, who work with their hands. But they also represent the outcasts, the people who are on the fringe of society. Interesting that even though sheep were so essential to the temple ministry, in the first century, shepherds had a bad reputation. Uh, they were considered lowly, uneducated, they were not permitted to give testimony in a court of law. They were generally lax in keeping the ceremonial law because of their uh, shepherding responsibilities. And when they were herding their sheep, they had a tendency to confuse my land with your land. They really didn't show much respect for what was mine what was, and what is thine. And so uh, they were really at, at, at the bottom rung, so to speak, of the societal food chain. But finally, the shepherds were also Jewish. In fact, all the shepherds uh, were, were Jewish. And so it's reminded to us that, that Jesus came for the Jewish people. He is their long-awaited Messiah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so uh, in this one group of shepherds, we have people who are tradespeople represented, outcasts, and even the entire Jewish race. And so we go from the shepherds and we have the magi. And uh, the magi, we're told, uh, were people who came, who were also known, excuse me, as wise men. So the magi were people who can find a legitimate study of the stars. We would call it astronomy today. And then they attached a superstitious belief and meaning to those stars. And so we're told in, in Matthew that they came to worship him. And the, the Greek word that is used here literally means to kiss. And so that, that idea became a very significant experience of, of people who came as this Magi, they came to kneel and to show adoration, to kiss the feet, to, to worship the one who was now born king of the Jews. So the Magi came. And so as we think of these Magi, there are three of them here. Of course, we don't know how many there were, but there were three gifts that they brought. And so the question is, what do the Magi represent? Well, first of all, they represent the non-Jewish population. They were Gentiles. They would represent many of us who are non-Jewish. So we're told that Christ was born in the first century, yet he belongs to all centuries. He was born a Jew, yet he belongs to all races. He was born in Bethlehem, yet he belongs to all countries. Now, speculation today is, is that these magi came uh, from either modern-day Iraq or Saudi Arabia. How significant it is that they came to worship Jesus. So, we see that they, first of all, they represent non-Jewish people. But secondly, the magi also represent successful people. Because, you see, they were people of resources, people with influence. The gifts that they brought, gold, 
and frankincense and myrrh would indicate that these were men of wealth, position, power, and influence. And so if we have shepherds who are at one end of the economic food chain, at the other end we have magi who represent the wealthy, people of position and influence. And then thirdly, the magi also represent scholarship and wisdom. These were learned men, men of scholarship, a learned understanding of the heavens. And they came and they worshiped the Christ. And so you begin to sense the, the spectrums. We have the shepherds who worshiped, or excuse me, who, who worked with their hands. And you've got magi who worked with their minds. And they all came to worship the newborn child. And so, in addition to that, we have Joseph. And as we saw last week, Joseph is this kind, righteous man who becomes a very courageous stepfather. And Joseph, in my estimation, represents fathers, stepparents, as well as men. Man. Now, when you think of Joseph, and you've got the shepherds, and you've got the magi, you see a, 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 a crash that is basically dominated by men. They're the key, they're the, they're, they're, they're the majority of the people in the crash. Uh, and, and while men dominate the crash, that is not being repeated today. That's not the scene in churches today. Because today in churches, we hear things like this. The ratio of attendance in an average typical church, 60% women and 40% men. Today, books are being written like this. Why men hate going to church? Uh, Well-known songwriter Matt Redman said in an interview a couple of years ago, he's English, he said uh, that if a, a man comes into church, is he going to connect with what's going on? Some of the romantic imagery that is used in worship, he says, the more I think of and I study scripture, I'm not so sure about that. In the Bible, you don't have people coming up to Jesus saying, you're beautiful. Even in Revelation, you don't hear that. He says, one of my songs ends with, I'm so in love with you. Maybe I should have written, I'm so in awe of you. Hillsong Music put out a song a couple of years ago. It's a great song. It's called, Worthy is the Lamb. And it is a great song. But one phrase says, Jesus is the darling of heaven. What man is going to sing to Jesus that you're the darling of heaven? It just doesn't occur. When I was uh, in North Carolina pastoring, we had uh, a, a, the pastor of our discipleship ministries, which oversaw all of our men's ministries. We used to have staff meetings, and one of his most regular uh, words that he would repeat was this, remember the men. Now, our church was right next to Fort Bragg, and I tell you what. We had manly soldiers. These were special op guys. These were guys who would jump out of planes, you know, 28, 32,000 feet with gear, and they would go behind line. I tell you what, what these soldiers did was just so incredibly significant. I mean, the testosterone that flowed through their veins. And he would regularly tell our worship leader and all of us, remember the man. And that's just what he was saying is this. We, if we make church palatable for men, we'll get the spouse and we'll get the children. But if we gear it towards the women, we may not get the men at all. And I think it's incredibly significant that in the first century, there were so many men 
who came and unashamedly bowed in worship before the newborn king. Men, fathers, I hope that you would not at all be ashamed of saying, I'm a follower of the Christ. This one who is so brave, so sacrificial, such a servant leader. Never apologize for being a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a manly thing to do. And so, in addition to Joseph here, of course, we have Mary. And as we saw last week, that Mary is this humble teenage virgin who becomes a highly favored mother. How important she was. Unique role in the history of salvation. Mary represents all women and mothers. When you look into the Gospels, you realize that there's some pretty remarkable things th that are recorded about women. Uh, the, the Gospel writers describe them as being faithful followers and financial supporters of Jesus. Uh, his own treatment uh, of women was nothing short of amazing, particularly with some of those that had got in trouble, and that he embraced them and welcomed them into his traveling group. And after his resurrection, his first appearance was not to the 12 disciples, but rather to a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. And in fact, Christianity was especially receptive to women because women understood that in Jesus, they were granted a dignity that no other ism or ideology afforded them. In those days, there was nothing like Christianity, nothing like what Jesus did to affirm a woman. In addition to that, the ethics of the Christian teaching, the sexual ethics that Jesus and Paul taught to the churches and continue to raise the dignity of women. And then up until Christianity came, men, husbands, and fathers were given a free pass when it came to sexuality and sexual fidelity. And Christianity changed all of that. And women identified with this movement because of how much Jesus valued women. So, we have heaven and nature. We have angels. We have animals. We have shepherds representing tradesmen, the outcasts. The Jewish people. We have the Magi representing the Gentiles, representing people who are successful and wealthy, representing human wisdom and scholarship. We have Joseph representing men, step parents, fathers, mothers, and women. They're all there. The entire world gathers at the crash to worship the Christ child. So I ask you this morning, are you there? Are you there? Are you bowing and worshiping him? I can't imagine anyone who would ignore what Jesus came to do. My father uh, was having, had colon cancer surgery, and so I traveled from North Carolina back to North Dakota to be with my uh, mother for a few days, and then we went to Grand Forks, about a 60-mile drive, uh, to visit him when he was there recovering from that. My mother was uh, suffering from dementia, and uh, uh, she was a lifelong Lutheran, and um, uh, we had talked about faith a, a number of different times. And uh, uh, 
in her later years, and I was there um, that time, I said, Lord, I, I really would like to have one really good conversation with her just to ensure that in these latter days does she have the assurance that she would be in heaven with you. And so I said, Lord, I need a half hour of complete lucidity so that we could have that very important conversation. And so we had gone to the hospital, we had visited my dad, and we're coming home, and as we're coming home, he gave me the window. And so for the next 30 minutes, we talked about having mom is having a real place. Absolutely. She said, it is. And I said, uh, at death, do you have any concern about going there? And she said, no, I'm, I'm going to go there. And I said, well, let's talk a little bit about how you get there. And so we began to talk about Jesus and about uh, what he had done. And, and I tell you what, uh, her understanding of the death and the resurrection of Jesus was just spot on. And I was so excited about that. And I said, now, mom, let's just talk about one final thing. We know that that's the, the truth of the matter. The question is, what, what have you done to respond to that? And she said, well, you know, I, you, you have to believe, and I believe. But she said, but it's also important that you repent. And I was just stunned. I just didn't know that that was a word that was on her vocabulary. And I tell you what, for those 30 minutes, my mom was an unbelievably good theologian. <laughs> and then the window closed. And we enjoyed the rest of the ride back. And my mom was a worshiper. She gathered. And so the question is, are you there? Are you there? I hope you are. So that in the midst of this most unusual 2020, you can say, I'm at the crash, worshiping the king, the newborn king. Let's pray. Lord, all creation is here. Because all creation felt the curse of sin. And so, Lord, these figures represent all of creation. Most importantly, they represent humanity, fallen humanity that has given the opportunity to begin to reverse the dreaded curse. Lord, I ask that if there's anyone here today who's played loose with the crash, that, Lord, today they'd realize that there's a place for them. worship and adoration and to confess that he is Savior and he is Lord. He is King, King of my life. And so, Lord, thanks for the Christmas crash. May it be deeply personal to each one of us as we see ourselves there, bowing before this babe who is the King. Amen.